Welcome to another deep dive. This time, we are taking a look at some fascinating research all about neutrinos. You've sent us excerpts from scientific papers, summaries from universities, and even a little bit of Wikipedia. It seems like you are really interested in how we can use neutrinos to create future technology, am I right? Yeah, that's definitely a big focus. But before we jump ahead to what's possible in the future, we need to get a handle on what we know about neutrinos. Right, that makes sense. So, like, what even are neutrinos? Well, they're like some of the tiniest particles that we know of, right? They're also neutral, so they don't have a charge. And they weigh so little that nobody's actually been able to measure their mass yet. Wow. And I read that there are more neutrinos out there than any other type of matter particle. Even more than protons and neutrons. That's wild. It's true. They're everywhere. And there are even different types of neutrinos. They come in three flavors, we call them. Electron, muon, and tau. Okay, so there are these three flavors of neutrinos, and they are super tiny and light. Is there anything else that makes them special? Yeah. So, get this. Neutrinos can actually oscillate. It means that as they travel through space, they can change from one flavor to another. Like, imagine, like, a chameleon changing its color as it moves along. Wow, that is crazy. So these tiny particles are constantly zipping around, changing their identities as they go. But where did they even come from in the first place? Well, we see them pretty much everywhere we look in the universe, right? So we've got neutrinos left over from the Big Bang, this cosmic neutrino background, it's called. And then a lot of neutrinos come from the sun. They're created in the nuclear fusion reactions that power the sun. Hold on. So every time I feel the sun's warmth, I'm actually being bombarded by neutrinos. Pretty much. And then there are also some other sources. Like supernovae, when a star explodes, they release just a huge burst of neutrinos. For a short time, it can be brighter than an entire galaxy. That's insane. Okay, so we've got the Big Bang, the sun, supernovae. Are there any other places where neutrinos come from? Oh, yeah. We also have neutrinos that are created in nuclear reactors. It's actually one of the ways we can produce neutrinos here on Earth. And even the Earth itself produces neutrinos through radioactive decay happening way down deep inside the planet. So it sounds like neutrinos are like literally everywhere, yeah. from the very beginning of the universe to the ground beneath our feet. Kind of mind-blowing. I know. And the crazy thing is, these things are passing through us all the time trillions of them every second and we don't even notice. Yeah, I read they're sometimes called ghost particles, which makes sense, I guess, because they're so hard to detect. But if they're passing through everything all the time, how do we even know they're there? How do scientists actually manage to detect them? Right. Well, like you said, it's tough because neutrinos hardly ever interact with regular matter. It's like trying to catch a shadow, right? Exactly. So how do they do it? Well, in some of those early experiments, they would use these giant detectors, like massive tanks filled with chlorine or gallium. Like the element gallium. Yep. And then they would basically wait and watch to see if a neutrino would bump into an atom and actually change it. I read somewhere that they even used a tank filled with cleaning fluid in one of the first experiments. Yeah. I can't even imagine how long that took. It's pretty amazing. I mean, they were working with what they had, but they still managed to make some groundbreaking discoveries. And today, of course, we've got much more advanced detectors. So what are we using now? Like, how do the modern detectors work? Well, a lot of them use these huge tanks of water or ice surrounded by super sensitive light detectors. And the idea is when a neutrino does interact with something in the detector, yeah. it can create this faint little flash of light. It's called Cherenkov radiation, kind of like a tiny little sonic boom, but with light instead of sound. Oh, I see. So the detectors are basically capturing the light produced from the aftermath of the neutrino bumping into something. Yeah, you got it. That's really clever. Yeah. But it still seems like finding a needle in a haystack. Like, how often do they actually manage to detect a neutrino? It's definitely not easy. But researchers are always trying to come up with new ways to improve detection methods. For example, there's this idea of using existing infrastructure, like high-voltage power lines. Wait, like the ones that run all across the country? Yeah. Or even Doppler radar systems, the ones they use for weather forecasting. They're looking into ways to use those to maybe capture these faint neutrino signals. So we could be detecting neutrinos using the same tech that powers our homes and predicts the weather. That's pretty incredible. It is. It's pretty wild. And it shows just how much potential there is for future neutrino research. We're really just starting to scratch the surface of what we can do with these amazing particles. Okay, so we've covered what neutrinos are, how we detect them, and even some of the challenges in doing so. Now I'm really interested to learn more about what we can actually do with these neutrinos. 
What are some of the possibilities for the future? Oh man, the possibilities are pretty much endless. But one area that stands out, like you mentioned earlier, is communication. Oh, that's right. I'm definitely interested in learning more about that. Yeah. But before we go there, maybe we can take a quick break and come back to that in a bit. I need some more coffee. All right. So communication. Like imagine sending messages through, well, anything basically, like the Earth's core. Or even like across galaxies with practically zero signal loss. Whoa, okay. So instead of using radio waves, which can be blocked mm -hmm. pretty easily, you're saying we could use neutrinos to send messages. Exactly. I mean, think about it. Like, communicating with a probe on the far side of Jupiter or even, like, a future Mars colony, you know? No more waiting hours for signals to go back and forth. That's pretty mind-blowing. But, like, how would that even work? How do you send data using neutrinos? Would we need to build, like, a whole new type of technology? Definitely. We'd have to find a way to encode information into the neutrino stream, maybe by, like, changing their energy or the timing of when they're emitted. It would be like a, almost like a cosmic Morse code, you know? Oh, interesting. So kind of like dots and dashes, but with neutrinos instead. Yeah, something like that. And then on the receiving end, you'd need these super sensitive detectors to pick up those tiny changes in the neutrino stream. Yeah, that makes sense. That sounds like a pretty big challenge. Yeah, it's a huge engineering challenge, but I don't think it's impossible. And the benefits would be huge too. Like think about security, a message encoded in neutrinos it would be practically impossible to intercept or jam. So like no more hacking? Pretty much. It would be the ultimate secure communication channel. And like because they interact so weakly, a neutrino beam could travel through just about anything, like even the Earth's core with no signal loss. Okay, yeah, so we've talked about using them for communication through dense objects. But you also mentioned sending messages across galaxies, right? What about that? Well, like, imagine a network of neutrino beacons, right, mm -hmm. spread out across the solar system or even the galaxy. They could act as relay points, bouncing messages across huge netances. So we're talking about building, like, a cosmic internet? That's pretty ambitious. Yeah. But wouldn't that require some seriously powerful neutrino generators? And yeah. even then, wouldn't it take forever for a message to travel between stars? Yeah, those are definitely big hurdles. Right now, we don't have the technology to create that kind of network. And the distances involved are huge. So even though neutrinos travel super fast at nearly the speed of light, it would still take years for a message to reach even a nearby star. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Okay, so we've talked about using neutrinos for communication. What about some other potential applications? I know I read something about using them to study the Earth's interior, like some kind of X-ray vision for the planet. Oh yeah, that's called Earth tomography. Basically, you could use neutrinos to create a 3D map of the Earth's insides. That's so cool. So how would that work? Do you just, like, shoot neutrinos through the Earth? Pretty much. And then you see how they scatter and get absorbed by different materials. Yeah. From that, you can build up a picture of what's down there. So it's like using X-rays to look inside the human body, but on a much larger scale. Exactly. But with neutrinos, we could see much deeper, you know? and get way more detailed information than we can with any other methods. That's awesome. What kind of information could we get? Oh, all sorts of stuff. Like we could pinpoint the location of mineral deposits or track the movement of magma plumes, even identify potential earthquake zones. Wow, that would be super helpful for a lot of things mm -hmm. like resource exploration or even disaster preparedness. So neutrinos could not only tell us about the universe, but also help us understand our own planet better. Totally. It's really remarkable the things we can do with them. And, you know, those are just a few examples. There are tons of other potential applications that researchers are exploring. This is all pretty mind-blowing. What else have you got? I'm ready for more. Okay, so how about this? Astrophysical research. Remember when we talked about supernovae? Uh -huh. Well, the neutrinos that they release can tell us a lot about what's happening during these huge stellar explosions. So like using neutrinos to see inside an exploding star. Exactly. Because neutrinos don't really interact with much, they can escape from the super dense core of the supernova, you know, and they carry information about what's going on deep inside. That's amazing. What kind of information can they tell us? Oh, all sorts of things, like how the star collapses, how neutron stars and black holes form, even stuff about particle physics. Wow, so it's like having a front row seat to some of the most extreme events in the universe? Pretty much. And it's not just supernovae. We can use neutrinos to study other cool stuff, too, like active galactic nuclei, gamma ray bursts, 
even the cosmic microwave background radiation, you know, that faint afterglow from the Big Bang. Whoa, okay. So neutrinos are like little messengers from all over the universe. Yeah. Bringing us information about all these crazy events. Yeah, you could say that. They're like these tiny little detectives helping us unravel all these mysteries. And there's even this idea of using them to study dark matter. Dark matter. Isn't that like one of the biggest mysteries in physics? It is. And some scientists think that dark matter particles could annihilate each other, and that would create neutrinos. So if we could detect those neutrinos, we could indirectly prove that dark matter exists. Exactly. And that's just one example. Like we were saying, there are so many potential uses for neutrinos. We've covered a lot of ground already, just talking about communication and Earth tomography and astrophysical research. I know. It's hard to keep up. Can we maybe take a minute to summarize what we've learned about the possibilities of neutrinos, just to make sure I'm following everything? Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about using neutrinos for communication, studying the Earth, and even learning about these crazy astrophysical events. I mean, it's amazing to think that these tiny, almost undetectable particles could have such a huge impact on all these different fields. Yeah, for sure. The potential is definitely there, but... Like with any new technology, there are still some pretty big challenges to overcome. Like what? Yeah. What are some of the biggest hurdles? Well, one of the main things is like figuring out how to create more efficient neutrino generators. Right now, we mostly use these giant particle accelerators to make neutrinos. You know, those huge machines. Yeah. But those are obviously not very practical if you want to use neutrinos for things like spacecraft communication or portable detectors. Right. You can't exactly fit a particle accelerator on a spaceship. Exactly. So we need to find a way to create those powerful beams, but on a much smaller scale. That's a big challenge. Makes sense. Yeah. What about detection? I know we talked about how difficult it is to detect neutrinos. Are there any ways to improve that? Yeah, detection is another big hurdle. The detectors we have now are pretty good, but they're still really big and complex, you know? Mm. If we want to make neutrino technology more widely available, we're going to need to figure out how to make those detectors smaller and more compact. Didn't we talk about the possibility of using things like power lines or radar systems? We did, yeah. And that's definitely something that researchers are looking into. If we can find a way to use existing infrastructure like that, it could really speed things up. Right. It would be a lot easier than building all new detectors from scratch. Okay, so we've got the generation of neutrinos and the detection. What else is there? Well, there is also the challenge of encoding and decoding information into those neutrino streams. I mean, it's one thing to just detect them and write, but if you actually want to use them to send messages, you need to figure out how to put information into them and then take it out again on the other end. That's right. It's like we're trying to write a whole new language, but using these subatomic particles. Yeah, pretty much. It's a really tough problem, but it's one that a lot of smart people are working on. It's exciting, you know? It really pushes the boundaries of what we know about physics and engineering. It definitely sounds like it. So it seems like we've got a long way to go before neutrino technology is something we use every day. <clears throat> but I'm still super fascinated by all the possibilities. What other potential uses are there? besides the ones we've already talked about. Well, one that I think is really interesting is the idea of using neutrinos for medical imaging and treatment. Wait, really? How would that work? Well, because neutrinos can pass through the human body without interacting with much, they could be used to create super clear images of our insides, like way better than x-rays or CT scans, and without the harmful radiation. Wow, that would be amazing. Mm. You could diagnose and monitor all kinds of conditions without having to worry about exposing people to extra radiation. Exactly. And some people even think that we might be able to use neutrino beams to like target and destroy cancer cells. It's still very experimental, Yeah. but the potential is there. Okay, so we've got communication, earth science, astrophysics, medicine. Is there anything that neutrinos can't do? Huh. Well, there are still limits, of course. But I think we're just starting to understand how powerful these little particles really are. And the more we learn about them, the more possibilities open up. It's pretty incredible to think that something so small could have such a big impact. I know, right? It's a testament to how amazing the universe is and how much we still have to learn about it. Well, I think we've given our listener a lot to think about. It's been a wild ride exploring the world of neutrinos, these mysterious particles that could change the way we understand everything from the cosmos to our own bodies. Absolutely. And thanks for letting me nerd out about neutrinos with you. Anytime. And to our listeners, until next time, keep exploring.